I'm going to talk about the final name that we see in this section of a sentence in a creed that we're looking at. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. And the, the word Lord is a designation to teach us His authority. And finally, one more time, I'm going to talk about a Hebrew understanding of something. And then, just to warn you, I'm going to contrast it with a Roman understanding of something. Hebrew's understanding of the word Lord. Although, as we read in the New Testament, the, the people that were around in the time of Jesus, they sometimes used the word Lord as a polite show of respect to somebody who has more authority than you. But primarily, the, the word Lord to them had a much higher and much greater weight to it than, than just that. Than just as, um, it's, it's interesting, uh, again in Spanish speaking cultures, um, they would use the word Señor to speak about Sir, and they would also use it to speak about Lord. I mean, can I get an Amen from the Spanish speakers? Or how, do you say, how do you say Amen in Spanish? Amen. <laughs> All right. I'm, I mean. <laughs> so, so it's, it's similar to the concept of how um, in Spanish it's, it's senor, but then there's like senor. Um, and so here there's, there's lord, but then most of all, the term lord had a much higher and weightier and thicker meaning. You see, much of the, the Jews, as I mentioned in, in Egypt, there was that Jewish hub in Egypt, a city called Alexandria. There was a Jewish hub there. There were Jewish hubs all over the, the Roman Empire, and even, even beyond that. In Acts chapter 2, there's Pentecost, and there's, there's Jews from all over the place. And the thing is, they don't all speak Hebrew. Remember, there's, a, there's that gift of tongues that we'll talk about one of these days. Get everyone awkward. But there's that gift of, of, of tongues where Peter stood up and was able to speak and it was understood in all the different languages of all the Jews that were gathered there. You know, there's a list, you check it out. There's a lot of, a lot of languages. And so we come to the point where in the first century, there's a lot of Jews. They don't speak Hebrew. It'd be great if there was some kind of a Greek version of the Old Testament. And fair enough, there was one. And the scholars got together. Um, supposedly 70 scholars got together and translated the Hebrew Old Testament to the Greek language so that all those Egyptian Jews and Arabian Jews and all the ones that forgot their Hebrew language from school could read the, the Old Testament in their own language. And in that, every Hebrew word was translated into a Greek word. And the word for God, you know, we read about Jehovah, some would say Yahweh, the, the name of God it would be translated as Lord. And we even see it in our New Testament today. We see the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. What that is, is that is the, sorry, the Old Testament. That is the, the name for God that the, the Jews believed that it was unholy. Sorry, they were not holy enough to write it down. So they wouldn't write it down. And instead they substituted a word for it. And the word they used was Lord. And so there are 6,814 times in the Septuagint, in that Greek version of the Old Testament, where the word Lord is speaking about the God of the Old Testament. And so to quote um, Wayne Grudem, thus any Greek-speaking reader of the New Testament who had any knowledge of the Greek Old Testament, which would have been a significant chunk, would recognize that in appropriate context, the word Lord was the name of the one who was the creator and sustainer of heaven and earth, the omnipotent God. So this word Lord is so much more than Senor, but it's like Senor, if you, if you know what I'm saying. It's so much more than, than Sir, but it's God. <coughs> and it's not just the, the Hebrew understanding of that word that matters, because... <coughs> As we've been studying the New Testament, we, we recognize that the church, the first century church, was made up of uh, Jews and a lot of Gentiles. 
And those Gentiles would have been birthed and grew up in the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire also had invested and put importance on this word, the word Lord. Uh, there was the, the cult of Caesar worship that was developing around this time. That, that it was required that a person confess that Caesar is <coughs> Lord. Very similar to what I used to do uh, growing up as a child in the United States um, before school. Every morning, stand up, put your hand over your heart, and you would pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, and you have memorized. And every morning, we, we'd stand and pledge our allegiance to the flag of our nation. And it was developed... Um, around this time and, and further developed in, in later years that a pledge of allegiance was necessary for the citizens of Rome. And they would, they would have to say and make a small sacrifice that Caesar is Lord. The emperor is Lord. And that's, that's saying, I submit to you that you are in charge of me. I am obedient to your leadership. And so this phrase... Jesus is Lord. It would have meant perhaps slightly different things to the two slightly different groups that would have heard it, but yet what it really means, what, what carries through, whether you're a Hebrew, whether you're Roman, what carries through is the idea of, of supremacy, of rule, of dominion, of the fact that you are the senior, I am not even a senior. You, you are senior and I am junior. Um, you are in charge, and I am not. And, and this transfers, and whatever culture makes most sense for you, just go for that. But recognize that, that carries through. It's true. There's a truth that Jesus is Lord. He exercises power over all things, and he is rightly called Lord. There's, there's not a thing, John says, there's not a thing that exists that he did not make. Therefore, he is Lord. But yet, I'm just going to close on this. Yet for us, in this place, at this time, in the history of what God is doing on the earth, there is a, a, a choice for us having to do with Jesus' lordship. His, it, it's interesting because the, uh, the created world does not have a choice whether they want to say that Jesus is Lord or not. It just, he just is. Of course he is Lord. But yet, for us, for humans, given this uh, troublesome gift of free will, we have a choice to acknowledge Jesus as Lord or to deny that Jesus is Lord. And again, I don't want to say that it either makes him Lord or causes him to be Lord. You ever like pull a chair out from somebody else as they sit down? No, you all okay. Um, it's not like, oh, you know, I, I, I choose to not acknowledge Jesus as Lord. And then the throne is pulled out from under him, and he is no longer Lord. He is Lord. But it comes to the question of, is he your Lord? Is he your supreme? Is he your ruler? Is he, does he have dominion over you? Is it something that you yield? <coughs> um... My friend uh, Pat O'Dryden from, from Carolina, he, he, he speaks of Jesus often as his master and commander. And it's cool, but I just can't help thinking of Russell Crowe every time he says it. <laughs> but but those, those are concepts that, that I believe carry across the word Lord quite well. The master and the commander. And Paul, the apostle, writes in the book of Romans, chapter 10, he says this, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and that if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. What he does not say is that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, then he becomes Lord, or he remains Lord, or it's some kind of vote, and he needs to, you know, he doesn't want to get voted off of Eurovision or whatever, and he needs everyone to call in and say, I vote for him as my Lord. But, but no, it doesn't have to do with his rule. But it has to do if, if we are saved or if we are not. If we yield to his lordship or if we resist his lordship. And just as much as Caesar 
and I, I hate to, to compare the two in a, in a way like this, but as, as Caesar would have blessings for those who acknowledged his lordship, and there would be dire consequences for those who rejected his lordship, likewise, our Lord Jesus offered blessing to those who acknowledge and live for him, who trust that he was raised from the dead, that he was put in the dead for a reason. We'll talk about that in, in coming weeks. And that was raised. And so I just want to close with that, with just that reminder of the Lordship of Christ, this reminder that He is the Lord, and that we have a call to submit to it. We have a call to acknowledge it, that He is Lord. 